Welcome everyone, Shavua Tov. Welcome back to the Other Israel Film Festival. My name is Isaac Zablocki. I'm Director of Film Programs at the Marlene Mars and JCC Manhattan and Director of the Other Israel Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us on this rainy New York night um, and uh, hope you're all well and enjoying many, many films. We've had conversations all day today, um, running every two hours for different films. We have the same tomorrow starting, starting at noon. We have uh, a, play, a conversation for the play Asher's Command, which that reading is available on our site right now. Um, and we're going to have Navid Negaban here. Um, he's a well-known actor from Homeland and most recently in Tehran, though I really liked him in uh, uh, the previous season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, and much, much more coming up all week. So Please join us for these conversations, be a part of these conversations. We love seeing your faces. We love hearing your voices. Um, we love giving you opportunities to interact with the filmmakers and, um, and please enjoy the films. And most importantly, tell your friends. Um, we're really, really excited to have this Saturday night event, your big Saturday night event, um, focus on the film um, um, Till Kingdom Come. We're um, really proud to um, uh, be connected and to be presenting this film this week. And I think there's much to discuss about it. I wanna take a moment to thank all of our partners. Um, you saw all of them on the screen before, but please check out um, our partner page on our website, see all the organizations that are doing the work on the ground on a daily basis. And when you're inspired by a film, these are the people who are actually working to create the change that the film is inspiring. Um, specifically for this film, I wanna highlight, of course, the New Israel Fund, J Street, American Israel Friendship League, and um, we're a very special partner who's been partnering with us probably from the beginning for many years now, and who's doing a lot of work in this field in a very important way at a crucial time, um, The Forward. If you are not reading The Forward, um, follow them, subscribe to them in every way possible. And we'll be sending out also specials on how to, how to get those subscriptions so you can get the best deal possible. Um, and with thanks to The Forward, um, we have here, um, to moderate tonight's conversation, um, we have the, uh, the um, um, Life Features Editor, Avital Shizik Goldschmidt. Um, Avital, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thanks for and she is going to be in conversation with the um, director and producer of the film, Maya Zinstein. Thank you, Maya. Hello, Returning. You. Returning to Other Israel was exactly four years ago um, this weekend that, um, that we had her here with Forever Pure, um, a wonderful film that uh, you should be seeing and uh, an Emmy Award winning film. And um, she is also gonna be in conversation with Abi Troen. Abi is the producer and cinematographer of the film and did of course a beautiful job. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Avital, but not without saying, of course, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will call on you when the time is right to ask your questions. Also at the very end, we're gonna allow you to continue discussing and have that right after the film moment where you get to meet the director or meet somebody and, and, and share an opinion that hasn't come up yet by doing quick breakout sessions. So please stay with us throughout this entire process. Um, we're really happy to have all of you here and I'm handing things over to Avital. Avital, over to you. Isaac, thank you so much for that lovely introduction for joining here tonight. Um, I am a big fan of this festival and I often attend it in person and I look forward to attending again in person one day, but now I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here tonight. Um, Maya and AB, it's really an honor to be on this panel with you. Uh, after watching this film, I was really uh, shaken by both the cinematography and the content, the questions that you're asking in this film. I had so many questions afterwards um, because perhaps Till Kingdom Come really strikes, strikes deeply at a dilemma that tugs at many American Jews and has certainly always sort of lingered under the surface for me uh, as an American Jew, as a Zionist. 
Um, and I was curious to hear a little bit about the backstory, all of the footage that didn't make it into here that may have gotten dropped on the cutting room floor. And specifically, both of you, Maya and A.B., are Israeli. And I was wondering what brought you to the subject of the American evangelical obsession with Israel? So I'll start and A.B., please join me whenever you think it's, you're ready. So first of all, I want to say thank you to the other film, Israel Film Festival, and to Isaac and uh, Carol specifically. Um, it's wonderful to come back, and even though I'm in uh, my living room in Tel Aviv, I feel that in spirit I'm uh, there with you. And I just also want to say that I'm really excited to go back and, and start con the conversation with the American Jewish community. I see a lot of uh, familiar names on the list of the people that attended that I met through my uh, um, visits in, in the different Jewish film festivals with Forever Pure. So it's really wonderful to come back. Um, so so I, I will start about, to try to answer your question, what drove me to this story. So basically after I finished Forever Pure, I've been searching for my, my next project and it took me a while, but in the summer of uh, 2017, um, I came across the story of the involvement of Christian evangelicals here in Israel. It actually, it happened really by, by, by mistake. I've been asked to, to help with a different project where the evangelicals uh, were just a small part in it. But that kind of brought me to start to uh, reading on this topic. And I also, I also uh, investigated journalists. So when I found myself for a month reading about, about the Christian evangelicals uh, till five in the morning, I understood that I probably uh, got something interesting. Um, it's important to understand that most of the Israelis, if they even aware of the invol involvement of Christian evangelicals here, they know it in a very kind of headlines. Um, most of them would tell you um, that these, yes, these Christians that love us, but not uh, much more than that. Um, but for me, it was also very clear um, that we have, then it was a brand new American president that is heavily backed by the Christian evangelicals. And it was also pretty clear that promises had been made through the campaign. So it was very interesting for me to start following this story. Again, it was the summer of 2017. It was before Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Um, but it was very clear that things are about to happen. Um, and, and for myself, in a very personal level, it was, you know, I, I have a brother that will go to in the reserve uh, special forces of the IDF and every next war he will be fighting the next war. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very interesting for me in the, name of, in the name of whom we're going to fight these wars. And, and I felt that this story of the involvement is really something that is unexplored. And, and unspoken here. And I thought that the Israeli audience deserved to, to know more and kind of to decide do we, what we think about this, please. Um, I can say just, just to add on to what Maya just said, I think um, there were two main issues that brought me on to, to this project and why I felt it was so important. The first has to do with the content of the film and the second with the filmmaking itself. Um, I think there was, you know, a unique place in time during the Trump administration in terms of Israeli-American relations. And filming that relationship through the prism of the evangelicals um, and how these people who live in Kentucky or Texas or uh, many of the other sites that Maya and I filmed uh, and also was part of our research along the way, influenced people halfway across the world was something that we thought was very important and, and um, as Israelis to do. Um, it tapped into themes that we felt were generally important at this time, like church and state in the United States, how uh, American foreign policy is influenced actually by domestic politics. And as Jews, we often, I think, think of ourselves as the ones who have control or, or, or hope to have some sort of control of our own destiny. And there was this kind of um, process working with Maya where we realized the, you know, that there are much larger forces at play. And this was really an opportunity to go and kind of 
understand what those forces are. The second thing that I really drew me to this project has to do with um, the, the collaboration with Maya and the desire to give a human face to um, uh, people who are otherwise kind of fall into stereotypes or um, this sense of what evangelicals are. And I think having spent literally weeks in Kentucky with people who love Israel and love the Jewish people um, and understanding who they are, what makes them tick and getting into the nuances of that um, was something that was very, very important to us. That this wouldn't be just a talking head film about an issue but that we'd connect to someone like an evangelical pastor in Kentucky who loves Israel, get to know him, and through that, try to um, understand a little bit more about the state of the United States, about the state of what it means to be Israeli or Jewish um, at this time. Thank you. Um, Maya, certainly, as you said, this is, this is an area that is unexplored um, to the day. And I think this is why this film is so important. And as Isaac mentioned in the introduction, um, why it's attracted so much attention from festival goers, I imagine. Um, Abe, you mentioned the human faces. And that was one of the pieces that really struck me as well while I was watching. And perhaps I'm a journalist, I'm always sort of looking for those human interest moments. Uh, one of the centers of the documentary is the Binghamton Baptist Church in Middlesbrough, Kentucky which I was shocked to learn was one of the largest church donors to International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. I was wondering what was that experience like for you spending time with that congregation, just landing in Kentucky? This is, I mean, this is a, a different universe for Israelis. I, I, it, it's a different universe for Americans, for New Yorker. And then coming from Israel, that must've been really something um, fascinating for you. Um, and also, you know, you show the Q5, Q5 conference, the seriousness with which American evangelicals take this partnership. You see people grasping hands, these very emotional scenes, very human. People are weeping, volunteering. They're walking the streets of Jerusalem, and you see the, the ecstasy in their eyes and the way that they're really connecting to something very deep, right? Let's go beyond the leadership for a moment, the larger places, we'll get back to that. But I wanted to hear from you, what was your experience like talking to the people, to the masses? Did you connect with them? Do you, do you mean masses at, at the Kufi conference or at the church in Kentucky, which? I would, I would, let's, let's stick to Kentucky for now. Let's talk about the, the church there. What, how is that connection with, with your projects? Maya, do you want to start or should? Yeah, you start, I will join. I'll, okay, so um, first of all, you know, there's the issue of how we met them in the first place. We met the community in Kentucky because they were on a, um, a uh, pilgrimage, a tour of Israel for eight days. Maya and I were supposed to join them for two days as part of research. And fairly quickly, we, you know, we met the pastor, the father pastor and his son, his successor, and they were, you know, I can't speak highly enough of how warmly they welcomed us into their midst. Um, and, you know, instead of two days, it turned into eight days. And in those eight days, I think we saw our own, you know, our own Israel, our country through their Christian evangelical eyes. And which was fascinating to see, you know, places we, we grew up and knew, but through this parallel um, lens. Um, it was also, it was simultaneously fascinating to see how genuine their faith is. They really, you know, believed in this. And that was something that actually left a very strong impression on us. And at the same time, we became aware that that biblical theological worldview at times erased um, the ability to see other things that were happening in Israel. Does that make sense? So theology trumped reality. Um, and so that's by the end, the yeah. problem. sorry. No, sorry. That's, oh. Sorry. That's, it's, just, it's not only a Christian problem, right? When theology obfuscates the ability to see reality in a well, complicated political situation. Hope, right? Hopefully that, yeah. that's, that's one of the questions that the film will, will raise to, for people, you know, after the, the light goes, goes out, the film is over. The, I, but, but at the end of those eight days, they invited us to Kentucky. 
And they said, you will see when you arrive that outside our church in the Appalachian Mountains, there are Israeli flags waving next to the American ones. Now, bear in mind that these were people who from a very young age had given to Israel and were taught to love the Jewish people. And aside from the select group, right, who had come on this pilgrimage of, I think, 18 people, they represented a church of several hundred. And so most, most of whom, I will also add, they, they uh, said about themselves, had not left the United States, okay? Or, or traveled uh, to, at great distances from their county. And yet they loved these people halfway across the world in Israel. So this really presented a unique opportunity for Maya and myself to go and, and see this world. And we had a lot of curiosity, a lot of questions. The relationship was based on a mutual curiosity. Again, for us, it was who are these people who love us? But for them, people who were, let's say, in their 40s, but since the age of 10 had given money to Israel, but never met a Jewish person, suddenly these two documentary filmmakers arrived with a camera in their church, and it really allowed for a lot of curiosity, questions, um, and a desire on both ends to really understand and ask. Um, and hopefully some of that comes through, um, that real genuine curiosity and desire to explain in a way that we can, again, present the film from rural Kentucky to audiences in, in the Manhattan JCC. I, I can add on I can add on your question, Avital, I think, um, I think the key uh, kind of, you know, and, and, and again, you mentioned the access and, the, and, and I think in, in this film, it was crucial because it was very clear, you know, you can make a film about Christian evangelical influence on Israel without interviewing one evangelical. <laughs> and that's something that uh, for myself and for AB as well, it was very clear that that's not something that we want to do. Um, and, and I have to tell you that, that personally, it was really important for me that these people would speak for themselves. Basically, this film is relies very much on sub on, on sub context in, in in a world of of text and, and with exclamation marks. So it was a, a big choice um, that has been really widely discussed through our um, through through the process. But but the, the biggest fights, let's say, were actually to get this access into Christians United for Israel. I can tell you that this is the first time that a, a team that um, like a filming crew that is not from Christian world has been allowed to film in Christians United for Israel. There's something very uh, unique in the fact that we were allowed to, to be there. But also to, yes, to arrive to these communities and actually to succeed, to speak with these people and, and, and to try to, to make them to speak for themselves but not only on the level of we love you, which basically that's where always the conversation starts. And I'm always joking that I, I went to make a film about love because the beginning of this journey was constantly about saying people that telling me, we love you, we love you. And I'm just coming to them saying, but what it actually means, this love, because how you can love someone that you don't know and you don't know me. So why you love me? And, and, you know, it's almost a philosophical question that has been asked through, you know, what, what is love? <laughs> um, but I think beyond that, you know, I think AB and I have been talking about this a lot when we were filming and, you know, this very long stays in Kentucky. I think, yes, if we were uh, Amer Jewish American filmmakers from New York, we probably wouldn't be able to make this film. And I also would be able not only because there was some feeling of suspicion towards us because we were representing something um, that probably the people in Kentucky would feel that we are not agreeing with them. But in a, in a, I'm, I'm, all, I'm telling this, it's, it may be like a curious, but it's thing that probably represents on the very deep way, like when I met the, 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 the family and, and the people from Appalachia, from Kentucky, I can hear that they have an accent, um, but I don't, I, I don't know, like I don't have any context to put this accent. I don't put them in any box. Uh, I understand that it's uh, probably, I've been told that it's a heavy Southern accent, but this fact doesn't say 
basically anything to me. So I think I didn't put them in a box, but they couldn't put me in any box as well. And I think it's a fair place to start to make a film when each side is kind of looking on each other on, on um, you know, in the eyes and says, okay, let's start. You will tell me who you are and I will tell you who I am. And, and, and then we can, we can start a conversation. So yes, I think it was a, a unique opportunity for both sides to kind of try to understand each other with, with, yeah, with an open heart. And, and I think that what we see on screen is, is really representing this, these very complicated questions of, of, this, of this very strange connection <laughs> between the Christian evangelicals and, and ourselves. Yes, I think one of those uh, really complicated questions that you raise in the film, you were able to really, I think, masterfully and very carefully contrast the poverty of Kentucky, right? Where roughly, I think I remember 48% of children in that county live under the poverty line versus the images of fundraising, just sort of collecting pocket change up to a lavish charity dinner at the Beverly Hills Hilton, right? So we are seeing these images of uh, poor Americans who are donating whatever they can to, to the cause of Israel. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very uncomfortable thing to view. One of the things I've wondered about is um, how they, several of the subjects alleged that the moment that they, these, their churches and communities give to Israel their personal finances and food, personal and communal. Right. Is there like an element of the wealth gospel here that they're sort of, it's not just about ideology loving Israel, but also, you know, those who bless Israel will be blessed if right. we give our pocket change, God bless us in turn. Was there an element of that? Yes. I, I, so, so just to, here, here are a couple things to think about in that regard. Firstly, it's important to bear in mind that evangelicals, um, unlike the Catholics, there's no one Pope. In other words, an evangelical could become potentially a pastor and have their own specific nuance and doctrine. Um, so that's just important to, to say. Um, that being said, there are a couple basics which are true across the board. One is that all evangelicals um, believe that the Old Testament and every word of it is fundamentally true and still is relevant today. So as you said, that implies two important facts. One is God's promises in Genesis to Abraham that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. They interpret that on chat, as we say in Hebrew, literally, fundamentally, literally, they believe that if they give to the Jewish people, um, God will bless them. So to paint you a picture, one scene that was omitted and, and left on the editing floor was actually one of my and my first shooting days in Mar-a-Lago, where we filmed a gala, or gala, I never pronounce it correctly, um, uh, in which the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews had extremely wealthy um, evangelicals come and donate to Israel and their organization. And what you saw in the Trump ballroom in Mar-a-Lago on massive screens, were testimony after testimony after testimony of wealthy evangelicals who said things like, I used to own a small business in Oklahoma and I started giving money to Jews and now I own a franchise. How do you explain that? God has blessed me for giving money to Jews. And this is again at Trump's estate in Mar-a-Lago. So you find here a unique kind of um, piece of, of faith where the, you know, we play a role in their agenda and their faith system. They serve for the Jewish, um, at least for the fellowship organization, a very practical financial need. And all this ties into the political sphere where the evangelicals are a voting bloc and is used for the Trump administration. So again, things that start with faith have very, very concrete implications. Um, just the second other thing that they believe in, which is particularly relevant in this case to the West Bank, is if they believe 
that every word that God promises in Genesis is true, that includes God's definition of what the boundaries of the Holy Land are. And those boundaries of the Holy Land include what is today Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. So if you're an evangelical and you believe God's word, we were told countless times that to go against God wor God's word and return any piece of Judea and Samaria or the West Bank is a sin. So, you know, on the one hand, this doctrine means we get a lot of money, but it also comes with a whole set of other religious do's and, and do and do not do um, that have very, very real and significant implications on us as Israelis. I hope that answered the question. Certainly, that, that Mar-a-Lago scene is really fascinating. I'm, that's it's shocking, but um, it's, yeah. Um, I, I kind of wish we got to watch it in the film. <laughs> I imagine there was a lot that you just couldn't didn't have room for. Um, another subject that you, that who comes in and who's, who plays a really central role here is Yael Eckstein, uh, who makes for a really, I think, interesting and almost natural subject for film. Uh, she has this sort of uh, totally not self-conscious way about her. She's very comfortable in her skin. She speaks very freely and openly. Um, you know, where she says, but that, you know, we, we agree on many things with Christians, but the end is different. Only one of us can be right. Uh, she's just very open about it. And you, you portray her uh, talking to her phone on a, on a selfie camera, video chatting with someone, and in the background, you have the pastor preaching about the tribulations that will come to the Jews who do not believe in Jesus. And that, that, that pairing of the, the visual and the audio is really brilliant. I'm really curious how you were able to convince the fellowship to, to include them, to follow them, to center the film on them as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, basically when you, when you start this kind of, when you find this subject, so the thing that I thought the right way to go is basically to kind of map all the key players of this unholy alliance. And of course the fellowship is certainly one of the leading players. And of course, Rabbi Kiel Epstein Zal, uh, he was one of the pioneers of this bond. So it was very natural to kind of go to them. Um, and I have to say that Initially, when, when, when we started, I, I was constantly going to, to Rabbi Axton and, say, and trying to, to interview him. And, and, and you know, of course, they, they were willing in a way, you know, when you can't say, I'm going to make a film about the Jewish Christian Alliance. So, of course, and, and it's important to remember, right, we, we came to make this film on the years when suddenly this Alliance, you know, Trump was in power. So basically they were celebrating this victory, right? Like, yes, as A.B. mentioned, one of the first seven days happened in Mar-a-Lago in Trump's home. You know, this is huge power. So, and, and in a very natural way, when you come into and, and saying, well, this film is going to happen <laughs> and I think you should be in it. They say, they say, yeah, of course I should be in it. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm part of the story. And, but that's, you know, that's um, kind of a lag in the door. It doesn't promise you anything. Um, and then it's, it's, it's a process of, that you have it with your characters. And as I said earlier, yes, we started from Mikiel, from Rabbi Axtin. And it was it's quite incredible, you know, and, and, and um, he almost, like, he almost knew because he was constantly telling me, no, you should go and film Yael. And I was constantly saying, no, I, I want to speak with you. <laughs> he was constantly saying, no, you should go and speak with her. So it was a kind of relationship that developed. Um, and yeah, and, 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 and I started to film Yael more and more. And of course, at some point when we found also uh, Boyd and the, the, the family from Kentucky, suddenly it was very clear that we also can make here a film about legacy and about two representatives of, of the new generation that kind of taking the idea that their fathers and grandfathers created and, and taking it forward. So suddenly, it, as, as Pastor Boyd says at the beginning of the film, 
this is where the indoctrination begins. And he's using this word of indoctrination. You know, I would never imagine even to bring it, this word into the conversation. But once he says it, and he says it, that's, and he says very openly, this is what happens. He says very, very openly. So once we understand. So once we understand. Oh, I don't know. No. There's some, suddenly something echoing. Now we hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, so why? The voice of God. Yeah. Watch yeah. out for lightning. Yeah, I, I heard my, my voice speaking from another. Anyway, it was very clear that we can make also here a film about how the new generation kind of takes the ideas of his family, you know, and take them forward. Um, and I think it was very interesting to explore with Yael this question, you know, how she finds herself uh, within this uh, business, uh, something that she never dreamed of. Yeah. Um, that's something that and, is... And, and this I found also so... Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, could we talk about, I think, ideology for a moment? Because that's sort of the big questions that is coursing through one's mind when one is watching. and and something that one is still thinking about when one ends the film, where Yael says, it gets really freaking complicated, but I don't know those extra five steps. She says that a little bit, I think towards the end of the film, for me, based on your experience, really immersed in this culture, um, and perhaps more on the Jewish side rather than the Christian, how do people stop themselves from thinking too far about what this money and what this support means? Well, and Abby, please join whenever you think, but you know, she can't afford herself to ask these questions. She can't, like, if she goes there, the all this alliance is kind of collapsing, right? So it's, it's, you know, it's almost very human. Like, I can't deal with that. I'm not going there, you know? There are people, you know, psychologists making millions of dollars on people that are choosing not to go there, with, not to deal with issues that they cannot deal with them. So I really think that in, in some level, it's almost very human. If she wants to keep doing what she's doing, she cannot go there. And, and I, would, I would take that even one step further. You know, there's, one of one of the, the big questions, at least that you've seen coming from members of, of the the progressive world, let's call it, during the Trump administration, was how do the evangelicals who are devout fundamentalist believers give their vote to someone who is anything but, right? Who has cheated on his wife, who speaks lewd, you know. And the answer is politics makes strange bedfellows. And we do live in a world, right, where there are so many bizarre relationships um, that affect policy on a deep level. And I think specifically as a minority, as, as Jewish people, which we will continue to be, you know, long past the, the 2020 election, the understanding that these minorities, um, I'm sorry, that, that these allegiances exist underneath the surface is just part of the system in which we belong. Um, and that is something that, you know, whether it's the Jews and evangelicals, the evangelicals and the Trump administration, half the films at, at, at Doc NYC, the less good version of other Israel film festival this year were about, um, you know, all these strange allegiances of the Trump administration, which go far beyond domestic politics, anywhere from dictators in the Philippines to Putin and, you know, this is very much the time we live in with right-wing leaders who got to power through very strange um, voting blocks voting to them and letting many values be pushed to the side. Yeah, the ends justify yeah, the right. means as I see that someone wrote now in the chat, which is on fire. Yes. Yeah, those are really points. Indeed, there are strange bedfellows in politics these days. I think I have time for one more question before we move on to the next segment of the program. Um, and this is something not partly artistic, but really more about uh, philosophy to my mind. 
you decided very consciously to open the film with the young pastor cleaning his guns. And then you come back to that image again at the end of the film. Um, and he describes uh, either, either himself or the weapons as God's instruments for his end time plan. And I'm wondering, why did you choose that to be the frame of the film? What what, what is the implication, if I might ask, and um, based, based on your investigation of the subject? So, you know, I would say that I, I definitely think that the opening scene is, is very much um, um, representative in, in a sense. I, you know, you need the first scene for your character that will do two things. One will kind of, in a way, summarize maybe in, in a certain level what we're about what we're about to watch but also would be intriguing enough uh, that will make the viewers to stay and watch the film and i just want to remind that he's yes he's cleaning his gun but the first sentence that he says he's quoting shakespeare and and for myself um this combination and um, you know this is exactly what this film is about it's always play with them um, images in a sort of how we perceive these people. Are they what they what we think about them? You know, this combination, yes, of maybe a pastor with a Southern accent that most of the American viewers would probably immediately put him in a box. But then for me, the fact that he's quoting Shakespeare is exactly the complexity of, of, of you know, of, of of everything that I'm showing, nothing is black and white. These people, you know, in in some levels and a human level, um, they're lovely people and, and they're smart people. On the other level, they doing things that I totally don't agree with them, and and I will never agree with them. Um, and and so so for me, this kind of playing with my uh, viewers, you know, and say, do I like him? Do I don't like him? What I think about this person? Um, that's exactly the, um, I think it's also really represents the um, journey that AB and I had uh, through these three years. Because yes, you, you, you start when you're filming people from so close for so long, um, you don't hate them. Like you don't, you're not able to spend so long with someone that you hate. Uh, and we never hated them. Uh, no. so I think we, this, confusion that we had through the process you know this big question is it actually good for Israel is it bad for Israel if it's bad for Israel why it's bad for Israel and I think for many times we found ourselves confused as well and and I think it was important to bring this all this complexity into the film as well maybe you probably want yeah to just to say I mean you know I I spoke to Pastor Boyd after he had seen the film and one of his comments was that, you know, at the first scene when he appears with a gun, um, he said, I can't remember his exact words, but the gist of it was his initial thought was, oy vey, you know, like, oh no, they, they put me with a gun. People will think I'm this, you know, crazy gun-toting pastor in the mountains who believes these wacky ideas. And then he reflected on the film itself he was very pleased to see that um, he was represented with more nuance and that his character evolved within that. So he was able to see that about himself, um, which I think for us was a sense of, you know, good, we, we managed to represent you in, in such a way um, uh, that he felt seen. Um, I think it's also important to note that almost in every Q&A that we've had so far, people say that they like him that they feel, you know, they may think he's a little misguided, they may question his um, indoctrination, but they appreciate, they believe him as a person. Um, even though some people don't believe Yael, him, they, they believe. And for us, again, that was uh, important to end with him as well, coming full circle with the gun. Bear in mind that in that frame, there's also a larger than life head of Ronald Reagan uh, while Boyd is cleaning the gun which I think for us was a sense of, oh my God, you really cannot make this stuff up. Uh, 
And bear in mind, again, we just had the 2020 elections. Ronald Reagan was a secular California actor voted in by an overwhelming evangelical um, uh, vote, right? That happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago. That can happen again in the future. And that is something that I think we all need to bear in mind before in 30 years, someone will shoot a film and you'll have a larger than life, life uh, Trump head in their garage as well. So that's a thought we hope viewers take with them after the film as well. We have a lot of questions coming in in the chat. The chat is blowing up as they say, and um, we wanna give an opportunity for members of the community to be a part of this conversation as well. Um, we're not gonna be able to get to all of you, but we're gonna to try to get to some of you. Um, please, our only request is of course, um, any questions and this conversation in general has always been so respectful. Um, we hope you'll keep it that way. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Marvin. Marvin, we're opening your mic. Oh, hi. Um, well, thank you. Um, I thought the film was amazing. I grew up in Kentucky and I actually had a lot of friends who were evangelicals. And my question is, the choice you made at the end to show the senior pastor, um, it suggested that the evangelical impulse might actually be much more cynical. And I wasn't sure if he knew he was going to be captured and what that said about your choice to, to end the film with that, that particular message. Thank you. Um, so, for, thank you for your question. Um, of course, he knew he was captured. I am not filming my uh, <laughs> my characters on a hidden camera. As you can see, he's almost looking into the camera when he says it. And, you know, when he says you're blind, stupid Jewish people, I have to say that in a certain level, this is the message that I want to say as well <laughs> to my audience. And I think it's really wonderful when, you know, I'm, I, as, as a director, I'm just asking a few questions uh, in the film and that's it. And I'm kind of letting the story tell itself. Um, and, and I think it's really amazing that kind of the message that I really want that the audience will listen to is uh, said by evangelical pastor at the end. <laughs> yes, I do think it's what he says. It, this is what I want to say. You stupid Jewish people, can't you see the evidently set for it before you? That's that's the that's the thing. Like um, who we made our best friends. Um, is it you know? Is it good for us? Uh, are we actually going to wake up in a, in a few years and say, oh my God, how we haven't how we couldn't see it before? So yeah, it's a combination, of course, of this moment when you it's you know it's a constant relationship of people that are not um, honest with each other yeah uh, I, because it, yeah. All of this relationship won't happen um so this moment of honesty that he had with us uh, is also of course the message that uh, in a way i want to <laughs> that the people will come out with if you want to add something yeah, I mean, I mean, just even looking at the questions here at the at the chat box in the Q and A, the question is, do they really love us, right? What do they really believe in their heart of hearts? And you know, that question is is the million dollar question here, and it is so hard to really, really get to to the bottom of it. And in that moment, bear in mind, this was after I think, you know, towards the end of filming. Um, after many days and many attempts to really understand that truth. There is, of course, the moment when they tried to baptize us, and I think they were genuinely disappointed that Maya and I remained of the Jewish faith. Um, and, you know, so that was one truth revealed. Also on our part to say that, you know, we, we appreciate everything you're doing, we're fascinated by it, but we're not going to embrace Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, and, and yeah, I, I don't know if there's a polite way of saying, saying, I think you're going to burn in hell, you know, it's just had to come out that way in an explosion. And perhaps just as the film begins with a gunshot, um, this way it ended with a bang. 
Thank you. Before we go to the next question, I also want to mention that a lot of people are talking about uh, the impact of the film and um, how to get the film out there. And I want to say that I'm going to save that for the last question. So stay on till the end and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but right now we're going to take a question from Roberta Kaplan. Roberta, you're on the line. Hello. Hi. I'm actually, that's actually not my picture. I'm at my friend's apartment um, and I'm listening to this, but Avital, Maya, Abraham, an amazing, amazing film. Thank you so very much. This is very frightening in my opinion. And my question is, Avital and the two, uh, the two of you, do you see a connection between the Haredi community around the world and specifically in Brooklyn and this evangelical group and have any of the Brooklyn Haredes ever been to this little town in Kentucky. I spent a lot of time in some of these parts and it's pretty frightening. So I'm just curious if they have even experienced it in real time. Amy, do you want to yeah. start? So uh, thank you so much for that question. I, I don't know actually specifically about the, the Haredi community. Um, not, not, that I, not, not that we know of. I think usually the, the relationship that we have found between evangelicals and Jews tends to be more on the, um, uh, let's say, the Eretz Yisrael Shlema or, or the, the whole you know, land of Israel more right-wing Zionist um, branch in, in Israel, um, and less so, from what I know, uh, of American Haredi community. Um, and again, the reason being that for right-wing Jews in, in, in Israel who hope to keep the settlements as part of, you know, eventually rebuilding the, the third temple, um, most American Jews, and I would assume most of the people even on the Zoom call are not anticipating the imminent rebuilding of the Third Temple. However, there is a much larger group of allies that they could find, and those are evangelical Christians. So again, right-wing, um, you know, uh, uh, settler elements in Israel found an allegiance with evangelicals in places like Kentucky. With all the differences they had, they shared that sense um, and belief in common. Yeah, they, they share, they, the, the thing is that the Haredi community is much less centered on the, Messa, in the messianic idea. So basically the settlers and the um, um, Israeli, you know, all the Rabbi Cook movement that basically has been based on the, on the, on the idea of Messiah. That's the, the idea that they are sharing with the Christian evangelicals when the Haredi community is actually very much not dealing with the, um, with the question of Messiah. For example, the Haredi community doesn't want to, to, to rebuild the third temple. They actually believe that going to the, um, uh, to the temple mount is something that you should not do. So it's, so the connection, yes, it's true that we can see some alliance, for example, um, Pastor Hagee that we see in the film, he has his uh, very great friend, um, he's a Haredi rabbi in San Antonio, Texas. So yeah, we can see some of these alliances, but I think mostly the, the connection of the Christian evangelicals we will see with Israel and specifically um, with the right wing and specifically with the, uh, with the settler community. Because they share in this idea of, of this, uh, um, the idea of Messiah, and of course, they are not agreeing on who Messiah will be, but that's something, as Yael says, I'm not going there. So yeah, they, they're not discussing who's the Messiah, but they definitely agree on the idea of, of, of his arrival. I hope that's helpful. Avital, did you want to add? I'll jump in just add one note since this is my beat, um, the Haredi community in America. Uh, I, to my mind, I think the Haredi community, as Maya just uh, implied, is much more um, 
utilitarian. It's much more, it's very practically focused. It's not driven by any sort of mystical ideology um, to that extent. Um, so that, you know, they're fine with being bedfellows with whoever uh, gets them what they need policy-wise, whether it is in education, whether it is in, uh, you know, tax breaks for, for profit organizations or whatever it is. Um, that's, that's really their um, priority. And I, I don't think uh, they're not particularly concerned with, with evangelical ideology or with funding, you know, towards, is, towards Israel in the way that evangelicals support Israel. It's, it's, it's largely, I would say, out of their um, worldview. Uh, of course, with the Trump administration, things changed with Haredim, with, I would say, Orthodox Jews sort of gaining a lot more access and power than ever before, arguably, in the United States. Um, you know, coming to the White House, political party, et cetera. Um, so there is perhaps more interaction there. I don't know if it is a meaningful one, though. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a question from Suzanne. Suzanne, you're on. Hi. Um, uh, I, we, my husband and I watched this movie today. We thought it was fantastic, and it was it followed um, the prophet. So I, <laughs> we've got a lot of crazy today in this house. I just um, uh, am curious to have a window into the Eckstein's um, view mm. of the Palestinians in the West Bank, um, because it was clear that the, um, I mean, you know, either they didn't go there or you guys decided not to go there. But the two places that it seems as if money goes um, from their, their crew is the, they gave a lot of money to the IDF and they, and, and they also, I, when, when it's advertised here, they're always giving money to sort of Holocaust um, survivors um, uh, who don't have enough money to feed themselves. So that, I mean, that, they're two sort of very <laughs> separate areas. So I was wondering if you got uh, more of a window, if there's more of a window into that for us, if you can. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so it's important to remember that basically the, the donation that of the Fellowship of, uh, of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, it's, it's pretty wide, but it's important to remember that all, it will always has a certain connection to the uh, Christian evangelical faith. So basically, um, if we say they are huge supporters of the Aliyah, of the immigration to Israel, they give a lot of money to the Jewish agency, to Nefesh Benefesh, to basically to bring the Jews um, uh, here to Israel. And of course, it's very much connected with the uh, evangelical faith that when all the, that one of the main uh, steps of the prophecy towards the uh, coming back of Jesus Christ is that all the Jews will uh, come back to here. So many of the audience of this uh, uh, festival now are actually ruining the prophecy. <laughs> And as long as you're sitting there, <laughs> you will never come back, but just to say. <laughs> um, so that's one. The second thing is, yes, uh, it got, the money goes to um, Holocaust survivors, to poor people, to people under the poverty line. And again, it's very much connected to the, to the uh, verse uh, of, from Genesis uh, 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you that God says to Abram. But it's also very much connected to the Christian faith that you need as Jesus were helping to the poor people. They believe that they need to help to the poor people. And the third part, yes, the, the part of the, of, the, of the prophecy, of course, it's the fact that um, here in Israel, there will be violence, and and, and as Pastor Hagee says in, in the in the film, God is watching every missile. And when Israel is involved in a major uh, war, pay attention because the eye of God is on Jerusalem. Um, so yes, the Christian evangelicals really love to donate to, um, let's say, uh, defense army causes. Um, um, I, I think the big boom actually was in 2006 dur during the Lebanon war when they donated a lot of money um, uh, to um, shelters, right? Shelters is the word. Shelters, yeah. Um, so it's, yes, the, the, 
you can't, and, and yeah, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Axton uh, said once that I think 6% of, of the money goes to the West Bank as well. Yeah, they're treating the West Bank as part of, of the bigger idea. Um, but again, all the money that goes, it goes sometimes for very good causes, but it always would be connected very much to, it will answer a certain, um, it will tick a certain box uh, in, the, in the Christian faith because that's how they, uh, they making the fundraise, you know? That's, maybe you want to add something on that? No, I, I, I think you, you said it all. Um... I think, I think it is, you know, to go to your question, the film, there's so many ways to, to have framed this issue, right? I mean, there is the, the woman we see at the top of the film, right, who receives the food box. Um, you know, bear in mind that in Israel, the organization is called Hakeren Leyedidut, which means the foundation of friendship. Whereas in the United States, it is called the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. In other words, people in Israel who, who are recipients of all this uh, generosity and philanthropy, in most cases, are not even aware that it comes from Christians. So, um, yes, I think the organization itself um, and the work that they do are have, have to constantly maneuver between the funders and the recipients, right? Um, which again, boils down to the same innate and, and, and kind of unavoidable conflict, which has to do with this relationship at its core. I'll give you just one, one additional tiny example. The arms, right? When you enter Ben Gurion Airport, there are arms, I don't know what it's called in English, but the, the things that walk you the from- sleeves. The sleeves, the sleeves, arm sleeves. Um, the sleeves that take you from the airplane into the terminal are filled with pictures, right, of soldiers saluting, of um, actually the elderly woman in the film. Today, if you would arrive in Ben-Gurion, you would see that woman hugging Yael Eckstein as you enter Israel, right? For an Israeli seeing that and reading Hakeren Neyedidut, the Foundation of Fellowship, they say, what a wonderful organization who are doing all this incredible work um, helping impoverished Israelis and, and really making change in our country. However, for an evangelical landing in Israel, there's a little sign in English that says, the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews welcomes millions of Christians to Israel. So the same sign for an Israeli, you're thinking, great, this organization is helping us, but will not notice what a Christian person thinks, which is, oh, we're home, this organization sees us. So, yeah, I, I hope, I, I think that's a telling um, story. You know what? Do we have time for one quick, crazy other anecdote on that line? Go for it. People are, oh. people are engaged. All right. So this is just the, another scene that fell in the editing room um, is that we filmed Yale Eckstein with Benjamin Netanyahu greeting a plane with several hundred Ukrainian New Olim or immigrants who were all wearing shirts that said the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. All right. This was as far as, as you know, as, as we were concerned, this was a fascinating example, again, to the point that people use this relationship for their own interests and means. Right. Because this was right before the elections in Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu really needed the Russian vote. Okay, he wanted the Jews who had come from the former Soviet Union to vote for him and not for the um, Lieberman, Israeli domestic politics. So he wanted a photo shoot with Ukrainian immigrants getting off an airplane and to be seen hugging them. For Yael Eckstein, who was there, this was an opportunity for her not only to show that she's close to the prime minister of Israel, this was an amazing photo op to show that the donations coming from evangelical Christians in places like Kentucky was fulfilling biblical prophecy and bringing the Jews to their homeland as was prophesied in you know, the, the, um, the Old Testament. I'm sorry, not the Old Testament, the Nevim and Ketuvim. But for the immigrants themselves who were getting off the airplane, 
who were in the you know excitement and and as well as trauma of leaving their homes and arriving with suitcases to this new country there they were wearing shirts saying thank you to the international fellowship of christians and jews meeting a prime minister who's using them for his goals and means you have the evangelicals who see them as part of some fulfillment of an ancient prophecy and there they are with their suitcases arriving to a brand new land so again these stories are, are countless and endless of the sort of way money is used for one reason it goes for a different purpose and ends up being part of a political um, tool uh, that is very much affecting the policies both in Israel and in the United States Thank you. I, I, there's a, there are many more questions out there, um, a lot more to discuss, but I wanted to end on, on the note of that this, this is one of the many films from other Israel, but uh, I, I think this one especially um, that should not just remain here in other Israel and I think needs to reach beyond. And I, many have been mentioning to me, at least in the chat, that um, this is a film that needs to, to reach the Jewish community, needs to reach beyond the Jewish community. And this is something that of course, um, that of course we we would like to see. Um, so one thing that I that I'd like to share with everybody is um, uh, that that um, we'd love to hear from Maya and Abby a little bit about their plans for the release of the film. Um, but also, if this is something that you would like to get involved with, if this is something, if you would like to help get the word out um, for this film um, with this film. Um, um, we're setting up some opportunities for that during um, this week, and there's going to be some meetings about um, supporting these efforts. Um, one will take place Monday at 10 a.m. If you'd like to participate in that, um, you should email film at jccnyc.org. Again, that's film at jccnyc.org. And I'll put that in the chat box, but I'll let uh, um, A.B. and Maya share a little bit about the plans with this film. Maya, do you want to start and all the... I'll just, I just want to yeah. summarize what happened here in Israel. Basically, the film has been uh, screened on uh, Can 11 on the Israeli public TV uh, a month ago. Um, and it was followed by, by a pretty good uh, PR campaign. And, and basically, the amazing thing that happened is that the goal that I uh, kind of started the film three years ago uh, when I said to myself, the Israeli audience needs to know about this. Um, so I think we achieved this goal because the, the, really the responses were so wide and, and really big conversations started also on the, uh, through OPEDs, and, but just the amount of, of responses that I personally received um, was, was really incredible. And I think in definitely our next stage is going to be United States, which I think it's a different conversation to have um, and not less important because, you know, um, yes, you have a, a new president and congratulations for that. But as we all understand that 25% of the American population are not about to disappear uh, with the new administration. And I, I think it's really fascinating also, and this is a topic that we haven't raised, but you know, the, the, how these relationship actually influence in the relationship between Israel and the American Jews, you know? And, and people are asking me here in Israel, but what's the problem? Like, if we, we can have American Jews and we can have evangelicals, and I'm always saying, listen, the, the American Jewish community are our brothers and sisters, and we have a shared story with them. Maybe some of the people in Israel don't agree politically on their, with on the views um, of, the, of the American Jewish community. But the bottom line is that we all see Israel on, this, on the same way and, and we understand why it should exist. And, and, and we also, you know, and, and we have a shared story. We have, and we share in the same goals. And the thing is that we don't share the same story and the same goals with the evangelical community. And, and that's something very basic uh, that I think lies on, on the, uh, as, as, as the, you know, as the basis of all that on, on who are your friends and, and what are the relationship between Israel and the Jewish community when basically Benjamin Netanyahu kind of chose for us 
and and said <laughs> and and chose for us who would be our best friends. Uh, so yes, I, I I really think that this is a very important conversation to have, and we also already started to see a huge amount of of requests from Milwaukee and from all over the uh, United States, uh, from uh, people that working in the Jewish agency, some local initiatives, um, and, and, and we're definitely now working on, on, on something that would be a, a well-organized move, and I will let AB to maybe to, to share a little bit about this idea. Well, I, I think, as Maya said, you know, from, from our very first uh, uh, starting point when we started working on this project and, you know, it was just a log line. It was just an idea, an exploration of the relationship between evangelicals and, and, and Jews in Israel. Uh, sort of, we had to write down what our dream target audience would be and who we would really want to watch this film, think about the issues discussed in the film. Um, the American Jewish community was central to that. Um, and so, you know, the film has so far been dubbed into German. If you can imagine Pastor Boyd and Yael Eckstein speaking German and, and shown on German national tele television. We had a Norwegian TV premiere this week. It's going to movie theaters in Australia. Um, but we're very, very eager to bring it to the United States and to the Jewish community and find that it is urgent that this becomes part of the consciousness and part of the understanding of the American Jewish community of what is going on. One anecdote that I think is particularly relevant in this sense is that when Maya and I were filming at Kufai, Christians United for Israel, the people there um, uh, referenced themselves as the more effective APEC. And they saw themselves as not only a replacement of the American Jews, but they saw themselves as a far more powerful uh, organization. And I think that, you know, Kufai and the evangelical Christians are not going to disappear, as Maya said, and this is going to be relevant in 2024, 2028, and long into the future. If there's one thing that Pastor Boyd um, said that to me after the, the election, he said that he had to comfort the children of the church and explain to them that the wonderful thing about American democracy is again that, you know, the evangelicals or the, the right wing uh, uh, members still have the Supreme Court and potentially the Senate. And they will fight very hard to make sure that in four years, they will have someone in power who reflects their interest. And Israel is a key part of that. So bear, bearing that in mind, we really want to bring this out to the Jewish community to think about. And therefore, we're, we're piecing together a distribution plan. Um, Isaac, how, how deep should I go into this? We're short on time. All right. We're piecing together yeah. a distribu distribution plan um, in order to get the film out to make it available um, in all 50 states and in order for people to access it and have a frank and, and deep conversation about the topics highlighted here. Um, and we hope that you can join us, those of you who are interested in helping promote it in this way on Monday morning at 10 a.m. And Isaac can give more details on that subject matter. Um, thank you. Um, before we break out, we want, to, we want this conversation to continue and we're going to allow it to continue. And the wonderful thing about this technology is that there are ways for us to interact and we miss it happening in person. And I, by the way, love it that there are so many couples out there watching this and participating together. Um, as mentioned in the chat, first of all, tomorrow we have a big day starting at noon with the conversation for Asher's Command, which is a fantastic uh, play that uh, um, we have the reading available online. Um, we have uh, the conversation for Golda and the Prophets, um, two films that really explore Israeli um, history and leadership in very, very different ways. Um, so please join us for that. We also um, have uh, Kings of Capitol Hill, um, tomorrow in the late afternoon. So um, that's more about APAC and more into American Israeli politics. Um, and um, at 6 p.m. tomorrow, we have uh, a conversation in Hebrew about some of the short films that we featured today. 
Um, please do tell your friends, help spread the word, get people to see these films now while they're, av they're available. Um, please join us in helping support this film um, so it has um, a fantastic release and reaches as many people as possible and has as much impact as possible. Again, you could email film at jccnyc.org and we'll invite you to the Monday morning event. I want to give a huge, huge thank you to The Forward and specifically to Avital Shizik Goldschmidt. Thank you so much for moderating this conversation. Um, and of course, um, thank you to Maya and Abi for um, joining us and being a part of this conversation. What we're going to do now is we're going to... Welcome back, everyone. Hope your conversations were fruitful. I know they were short. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for chatting with others and being a part of this community. Um, we're really grateful to make you a part of this. Join us all week for more events. Help us spread the word um, about this film and about all the wonderful films that are going on this week. Um, I wanna thank all of our partners once again, and especially tonight, The Forward. Um, and if you want to join on the Monday um, breakout session, the Monday session, um, you just need to email film at jccnyc.org. Again, that's film at jccnyc.org. Thank you again to Maya and AB and to Avital. Have a good night and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isaac, and thank you, Carol. And I hope next year you will, will be able to have a, a real physical festival. This is so much nicer. You get to have breakout sessions. <laughs> Imagine trying to do that in person. <laughs> no, 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 I want to go back and visit you in person. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yetzi. Thank you, Avital. Thank, thank you, everyone, for watching thank the film. Thank you very much. Thank you, Avital. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah. And thank you all for watching. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good night.